Good old Nintendo, hey? Everyone loves those cheeky jappy chappies from their adored mascots, innovative creations, to them single-handedly saving the entire video game industry from collapse. Except that's not entirely true. You see, the problem with nostalgia for a much-loved company is that it's often fed through Chinese whispers, to the point they're often twisted into fanboys' wishful thinking of history. So this episode, we dig deep and discover who actually did invent these amazing gaming creations that the Big N have been wrongly accredited for over these decades. Some of which are so surprising that even a clueless Kubel himself would find them hair-raising. But, hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five times Nintendo didn't come first. We'll start off with a simple one, because this one really shouldn't even be here. I mean, come on, given how long analogue controllers have been around for, this isn't even a discussion we should be having. Yet, despite the overwhelming evidence on the contrary, Nintendo still get credited with this invention. The first use of an analogue stick on a games console can actually be traced all the way back to 1978, a full 18 years before the Nintendo 64 even existed and a console from Germany no less. The Interton VC4000 was released just a year after the best-selling Atari VCS, hoping to quickly grab a slice of this new and exciting marketplace. Although you might not have heard of the Interton console before, you may be familiar with some of its many clones. This is because the hardware was licensed to numerous companies around the world, such as Grandstand in the UK, Fountain Electronics in Australia, and Carvan Video in France. Though many of these manufacturers used their own designs that often meant their systems weren't actually compatible with each other, they all used the same analog sticks. But if you want to be really pedantic and only cite mainstream success, then the Atari 5200 from 1982 also boasted an analog stick, albeit a very flawed one that ultimately contributed to the system's downfall. But perhaps the best example, however, is Milton Bradley's iconic Vetrix console from the same year. Like the Nintendo 64, this system was also sold on its advanced 3D graphics, only this time they took the form of glowing vectors rather than fuzzy polygons. Not only was the stick used to aid with movement in three dimensions, but also used a small thumbstick design similar to Nintendo's. Case closed once and for all, I hope. Now, this is a bit more of an obscure one, but still very much another open and shut case. The first use of battery backup to save game progress is often attributed to the 1987 US release of Nintendo's seminal RPG, The Legend of Zelda, a title that helped cement the NES in the hearts of American gamers and launched the ever popular franchise that many still fawn over even to this day. But the first use of battery backup in a game cartridge actually came nearly a whole year before, with the late 1986 release of Hide Lied 2 for the Japanese MSX computer. Another game in a long-running RPG franchise, Hide Lied 2 allowed you to save your progress and come back to it at a later date, just like Nintendo's more famous creation. Even if you want to restrict this accolade to home consoles, Zelda was still beaten to the market by Sata's Marita Shogi for the Nintendo Famicom, released just four months earlier. This Japanese chess sim allowed you to save the status of the board and pick up a game in progress anytime you liked. Checkmate, Nintendo! However, the Guinness Book of Records still incorrectly lists Nintendo as being the first with battery backup. <laughs> Poor old Norris McWhirter must be spinning in his grave. <laughs> if you know your video game history, then you will most likely be aware that Donkey Kong is credited as being a game that saved Nintendo. 
the company had been struggling to break into the lucrative US arcade market, and the flop of their expensive to produce 1979 coin up, Radar Scope, was looking like to be the final nail in the coffin. After the game failed to engage audiences, Nintendo gave their lead games designer, Shigeru Miyamoto, one last chance to come up with the goods. The only caveat being that he had to produce something that could make use of the existing radar scope hardware, as Nintendo simply couldn't afford to design something new. The game that Shigsy came up with was Donkey Kong, and the rest, as they say, is history. This 1981 story of a carpenter, his girlfriend, and a burly ape became an almost instant success, launching a character that became known as Mario into the public eye, and giving Nintendo the worldwide recognition they so desperately craved. But as well as becoming a part of pop culture that it jaws to this very day, Donkey Kong is often credited as being the game that launched the genre we know today as the platform game, or platformer. However, this couldn't be further from the truth, because Donkey Kong certainly wasn't the first. Hell, it wasn't even the second! Although, it's fair to say that the game did introduce some new gameplay mechanics. The game widely credited as being the very first platformer is, in fact, Space Panic, a 1980 arcade game from Universal, more famously known as the creators of Mr. Do. This title featured many of the things we associate with platform games to this day. Ladders, enemies, appealing characters, and, of course, platforms. However, what makes this slightly contentious is that you couldn't actually jump, something that many Nintendo fanboys will argue disqualifies it. However, other games that predated Donkey Kong, which include platform-based gameplay, include the 1981 Nichibutsu arcade game Crazy Climber and Sega's Jump Bug from the same year. The interesting thing about the latter game is that it not only introduced the jumping mechanic, but also the ability to collect items. So take that, Nintendudes! Arguably Nintendo's biggest success story of more recent years is the Wii. Not only did it put Nintendo back into the mainstream after the relative failure of the GameCube, but also managed to appeal to a whole new market that had previously seemed impenetrable to console manufacturers, the casual gamer. Back in 2006, everyone wanted a Wii. You, your kids, your wife, your friends, and even your nan. Through innovative products and games such as Wii Fit, Wii Sports, and Jerry Rice and Nitus' Dog Football, the Wii managed to capture the intention of the entire world. The key gimmick that saw the Wii outsell its more vastly powerful rivals was the use of motion controls. This new gameplay mechanic had everyone waving their arms about like they're having a fit at a rave, and saw loads of new types of games being developed to make use of it. Although it needlessly ruined a few games too. I mean, Rampage Total Destruction, I'm looking at you. While Nintendo won the adoration of the masses alike for this feature, they were far from the first to use it, despite reports to contrary. The first use of motion controls was found in the hydraulic arcade games that became so popular in the mid to late 80s, starting with Sega's Super Hang On. But its first use on home systems is somewhat more complicated. Early attempts at this kind of control usually used mercury switches or even simply a ball bearing that moved around a tube. An example of this technique is seen in the awful Le Stick, a dismembered looking abomination made for the 8 bit home computers by Datasoft in 1982. However, a search of approved patents, or patents if you're American, tells us that the first console manufacturer to both design and retail a proper motion control device is Dutch electronics giants Philips for use with their much maligned CDI multimedia player. In fact, this patent is actually referenced in Nintendo's own application for the Wii, so Philips actually earned a royalty on all 100 million odd consoles sold. <laughs> I guess that helped them recoup some of the cash they lost from the CDI. But they didn't actually use this technology for a normal controller as you may think. In fact, it went to their light gun, or Peacekeeper Revolver as it was called in the Mad Dog McCree packing. 
Instead of tracking the beam from the TV, like regular light guns, the Peacekeeper had a small black box which plugged into your console and then had to be positioned on top of your TV. <laughs> Does that ring any bells? So, the first motion controller was actually used to shoot terrible actors on a console hardly anyone bought and nothing to do with Nintendo at all. And, as always with Fact Hunt, we've definitely saved the best until last. And I'm sure that many of you out there are already up in arms. But what about the Game & Watch Larry? Or the NES Joypad? Or the Game Boy? Well, I hate to pee on your bonfire. Well, I'm not actually, I wouldn't be making these videos. But Nintendo didn't invent the Joypad. The D-Pad? Cross Controller? Or whatever you want to call it. This was just another invention that Nintendo simply borrowed and then made more popular. The first use of what we consider to be the modern design for a D-pad came about in 1981, around a year before Nintendo's Game & Watch range arrived, their first use of such a design. Versions of things that loosely resembled a D-pad had been around earlier, such as singular buttons and a cross shape on numerous coin-ops and handheld games, as well as the disc shape controller for Mattel's Intellivision console. But for the first cross-shaped pad, we once again return to our old friends at Milton Bradley, and the world's first handheld games console, the MB Microvision. Oh yeah, the Game Boy wasn't the first one there either. Sorry Nintendo Zealots. One of the unique features of the Microvision was the interchangeable controllers. Early games from the machine often used a simple wheel like the Atari 2600 paddle controller, but later games required something more advanced. So, for the release of Space Shooter Cosmic Hunter, MB came up with a cross-shaped joypad that could be stuck into the bottom panel of the device. Alongside this, there were two action buttons, forming the now unmistakable look of a joypad. Nintendo weren't even the first to copy this design either. Grandstand did it nearly a year before, with handheld games of their own, such as Pac-Man ripoff Munchman. But there you have it. All these years, Nintendo have been selling you a huge fat whopping lie. Makes you wonder why Pinocchio Peter himself never worked for them, hey? <laughs> Hello you! Thanks ever so much for watching! Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon! But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time! Ta-ra for now!